Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. What a deep delight, what a profound privilege, indeed, what an honor, humbling honor it is to come before you again, Florida East Coast, and indeed, I relish the privilege afforded me by our wonderful, phenomenal leader, moderator Phil Parr. Again, I say in redundancy, indeed, I think uh, it is ordered. Thank you for your kindness and thank you for your trust and your deposit that would privilege me to share on this platform. Indeed, I salute all of you watching tonight as I attempt to share with you the second, perhaps, conversation of a two-part series. And of course, I commence with prayer. If you would pray with me a moment, and then we'll delve into Holy Scripture. Father, thank you again for the blessed privilege to share your word, to represent Indeed, God, your person, it is my prayer now that you'll move my mind to new heights of revelation. And indeed, I pray that you'll grace my tongue with fluidity, revivify Holy Spirit, my interior. God, speak to the end that your voice is heard, transcend mortal ambiguities, and in clarity, God, give voice. In the blessed name of Jesus the Christ, amen. I call your attention again to our thematic text recorded in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 28, and I want to lift again verses 16 through 20. Their classic text, again, we have profiled and pigeonholed the text as the Great Commission, the Grand Commission, and indeed, I think it is ripe and ripe for the church to hear it in redundancy. Listen to the word of the Lord as it is extracted from the New American Standard Version of Holy Writ. But the 11 disciples proceeded to Galilee, to the mountain which Jesus had designated. When they saw him, they worship, worship him, but some were doubtful. And Jesus came up and spoke to them, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be unto God. Whenever I iterate or reiterate the revelation that is resident in our reading I am fully aware of extensive exposure to the end that I take the liberty to say that most people who would leverage the language of this text, most people love and indeed leverage the latter line. Lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the world, our ages, and of course, we love it because it's comforting, it's consoling. But at the end of the day, what we miss in the text is that the text suggests that evangelism is demanding and evangelism is daring. In fact, ultimately, evangelism is adventurous. Now, with that said, let me commence where I think I need to in this second part of a two-part series that I want to once again accentuate our national theme thrust. Of course, you know it. Let me just 
express it afresh. Envisioning the future exceptionally few Christ-centered evangelism. Because ultimately, the text suggests that if the church is not functional, that is functional in the prescribed purpose that has been given to us by the sovereign, that church or churches have a bleak, perhaps blighted presence, but a bleak future. In fact, if you're not going to function evangelistically, you might as well start planning the funeral. In fact, you might as well give yourself to funeral arrangements. I know that's not where you want to be, and so I've come to talk to you about how to avoid premature death, how to avoid sabotage and subversive activity. How do I avoid death? Hence, many of our churches are moribund. Hence, dying, some on ventilators, perhaps potentially can be revived. And so, with that said, I want to talk to you because if we're not careful, we'll become too complacent and too content with the crowd or perhaps the little crowd that we have coming and we'll grow comfortable and we are consoled by the fact that it's still, out of all these years, a few of us. And moreover, we'll forfeit the blessings if we don't engage in this duet or this duo labor with our Lord. And so let me suggest to you that the keynote of evangelism in the parlance of the Apostle Paul is Christ and him crucified. The heart of evangelism is Christ. Now, of course, again, let me emphasize the call and cost of evangelism is discipleship. Let me say that again. The call and cost of evangelism is discipleship. And perhaps again, if we are deficit in disciple making or discipleship, we undermined evangelism because evangelism was predicated upon discipleship, making disciples. Now, that's key because a disciple, by definition, is perhaps a convert who is consciously committed to copy the character of Christ, suggesting that a disciple is one who embodies incarnationally the love of God in Christ. To the end that a disciple becomes an incarnational phenomenon. Hence, we don't only speak for Christ. We represent Christ. We embody Christ. We are the body of Christ. When you understand your identity, you understand better your purpose in its truest expression. Now, last time I tried to express to you, and I'll say again, because I like the insights of that great uh, 20th century mystic devotional writer, E.M. Bounds, who reminds us that while the church is looking for better methods and, and, and more machinery, God is looking for better men and women. In fact, Ian Bounds would suggest to us that God's method or methods by which God operates is few men. Now that's critical because J.B. Kilpatrick, who wrote some years ago a book 
on New Testament evangelism. And he makes it clear to us that the power of God to save does not magically rest upon rites or book or an uttered phrase that if the power of God is perhaps prevalent, it is because the power of God normally works upon men through men. Now that's critical because if we're going to evangelistically, if we're going to evangelize, if we're going to disseminate the good news, the hope of the gospel, the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ, you and I must discern that evangelism is a duet. It's a duet. It's a duet. Hear me. You don't do it without him, without Christ. And I will tell you this. I don't care how shrewd, how crafty, how ingenious you are. Effective, efficacious evangelism is the result of a duet. It's the church in collaboration with Jesus. Now, that's critical. I want to say that again. It's a duet. Now, if it's not a duet, you will perhaps maintain business as usual in these unusual times. Yes, you'll go through the routine. You'll go through your prescribed regimen. Matter of fact, you will be run of the meal if you don't discern that you and I are called to a duet, that we are called to do evangelism in, hear this, collaboration with Christ. It's a duet. Now, if it's not a duet, you and I are subject to be dorsal and not dynamic. Now, that's key because can I tell you that God has designed the church to be dynamic. And yes, to be dynamic in worship, as I talked to you last evening, because I suggested that you cannot witness if you don't worship. And I suggested that if we're going to celebrate the gospel or celebrate Christ, it's through our adoration of him. We have to worship him. And worship has become, I suggested, the deficit, and I suggested the debacle of worship because I suggested you dispositionally, every man, every woman is designed for worship. And that's why we have to be busy evangelizing because that center on the corner is designed. Might in fact, the sage would suggest that God has placed eternity in his heart, in her heart. And you can't forget, Eter might in fact, Paul David Tripp wrote a book some years ago. He titled the book Forever. And of course, he says that many of us, many churches, many believers suffer from what he calls eternity amnesia, suggesting that we don't see church a life from eternity's perspective when you see life from eternity's perspective you understand that every individual is literally demonstratively distilled in dignity in dignity yes because every individual has the imago day the image of god every individual dispositionally has the design for doxology or worship. And so I want to make it clear again that if we're going to be efficacious, if we're going to be effective and efficient evangelistically in the spirit and discipline of evangelism, I want to say again, it has its commencement in celebration. If you can't celebrate God privately, personally, corporately, you will not give conversation to God publicly. You will not disseminate, proliferate 
this gospel if you are not rooted in reverence and revelation. If you don't worship God, you will relegate evangelism. Perhaps the Barney group would say you will outsource evangelism as if it's for the church and not for you. So here's what I want to do with the time that I have tonight. I want to take us through now verse 18. Here's verse 18. And Jesus came up and spoke to them saying, I want you to hear because you got to hear the declarative dictum of our Lord. Here's what Jesus said. It's declarative. He says, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Now, here's what the text indicates I give to you. That Jesus declares his dominion. Now, that's key for the church because it is in this text, in this passage, that he reveals our sanctioned and sanctification. It is in this text that he reveals our servitude and our significance. Let, let me read it again so you can get it. All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. What Jesus simply says is this, that I am dominant in every sphere of time and eternity, my power interpenetrates the planet. I am sovereign. I'm Lord. The grave death couldn't keep me. My fact couldn't hold me. Couldn't store me. I was raised on the third day and now I have all power in my hands. You say, why is that important? That's important because the dominion of God is what gives us our distinctives. Matter of fact, we're distinguished distinctly. We are currently conditioned in time because there is no other entity whom the Lord has authorized for his biddings but the church. Now that's what, that's what makes us distinguish and distinctively, that's what sets us apart. We have divine sanctioned and sanctification. We've been set apart. You hear me. We've been set apart and we have authorization. We've been authorized. And that's why we can't keep quiet. That's why we can't be tacit. We can't be mute because if we don't tell it, Hear me, if we don't tell it, woe be unto the church because we've been sanctioned, we've been sanctified under kingdom dominion. Hence, you understand that priority for you and I should be the right life that God has designated for us. And that is life in the kingdom under the dominion of Jesus Christ. Let me tell you why I love his dominion. I love his dominion because if you don't know his dominion, the danger of evangelism will detour or distract you from distilling the gospel message. You have to be daring because evangelism can be dangerous. Of course, Matthew understands this contextually, that he is literally expressing the gospel in a context where Caesar is presumptuously perceived as Lord. And of course, to declare that Jesus is Lord is dangerous. It's daring. But nonetheless, you and I are under the dictates of the Lord, hence his dominion. Now, let me read it again because there's a nuance that I have to share with you. All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. And what Jesus says is there ought not be any ambivalence, ambiguity. You ought not be hesitant 
Matter of fact, inexorably, you ought to engage in the work of evangelism because he says, I not only have dominion, but with my dominion, I have given you a deposit so that you can be dynamic, so that you can disseminate the evangel. Deposit, yes. You remember, you've read it. Acts 1 and 8, you shall receive power after you've received the Holy Ghost and you're going to be witnesses unto me. Here's the point. The church has no excuse, indeed, no justification for not being eagerly and earnestly engaged in extensive and expansive evangelism because the Lord has not only declared his dominion and distinctively and distinguished us, the Lord has sanctioned and sanctified us, but the Lord has also given us a deposit of the Holy Spirit so that under the governance and the guidance of the Holy Spirit, you and I ought be gravid and indeed graciously distilled. What that suggests is we ought to be productive and prolific because of the deposit of the Holy Spirit who walks alongside and empowers us to do what only he can do through us, and that is bring witness to the power of God to save sinners. And so you hear it now. It is the dominion of God, according to this text. But it's not only the dominion of God. Here's what I see. You, get, you can't miss this. You can't miss the dimensions of evangelism because I believe we've missed the dimensions of evangelism and hence most churches do evangelism asymmetrically to the degree that there is no balance there is no balance here's the point the point is what are the dimensions of evangelism I, I know you you say well Tell us, Kennedy, because I think you're making this more complex than it is. I'm trying to make it as clear as I possibly can. Here are the dominions, hear this, dominions, dimensions, that is, of evangelism. Jesus says, go. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations. Now, now let me tell you this. Evangelism is inclusive of both sharing the gospel and that is vocally vociferously we keep on sharing it but not only sharing the gospel showing the gospel now you got to hear me because evangelism for the church must be more than the acute dictum or acute doctrine that we seek to didactically expose people to no we got to teach it doctrinally we got to be sound yes our dictum needs to be substantive but i want to tell you if all we have is doctrine and dictum then the world remains dead in sin and trespasses here's the text the text says you have to literally process the dimensions of evangelism. He says, you go, and as you go, he says, I want you to share this gospel because it is through the sharing of the gospel that men and women are saved. How can they hear without a preacher? Here's the point. Everybody evangelistically have to perceive, not presumptuously, but humbly, that you are called to give voice to the gospel. But I'm telling you, giving voice to the gospel is just one dimension. Share the gospel verbally, vocally, vociferously. Share the gospel. Keep your mouth moving. Tell the world how gracious God is. Tell the world how good that he died for their sin while they are sinners, that God loves them lavishly. And so he 
would go before them. Hence, he would providentially die with them in his heart so that he might save them to eternal life. Go ahead and share that. But here's what I want you to see. There's another dimension of evangelism that we miss. Evangelism is about the soul, yes. We want soul saved. But evangelism is also about the body. We want body saved. And that is to suggest that we don't just want salvation, we want liberation. And you say, where you get that from? Well, you haven't read the Gospel of Matthew. Because the Gospel of Matthew literally gives us the dimensions of evangelism. That it's not just vocal evangelism. We ought to talk about Jesus. But it is also evangelism that includes the body. Not just the soul, but the body. We don't just give perhaps words to salvation. We give witness to liberation. Here's what Jesus says your evangelism ought to look like. He says it ought to look like not only sharing, but showing the gospel. Yes, share the love of Christ, but show the love of Christ. Jesus says, here's how you do it. He says, listen, I was hungry and uh, you, you didn't feed me. No, you didn't. I was thirsty and you didn't give me anything to drink. I was naked and you didn't clothe me. He says, I was sick and you didn't come visit me. I was in prison. He says, okay, well, here's the question. Well, Lord, when did we see you? He says, listen, if you've done it to the least of these, you've done it also unto me. I'm trying to say to the church, we can't be satisfied with being one dimensional in our evangelism. We have to be two dimensional because the dimensions of evangelism is that I share, yes, the gospel because I want souls saved, but I show the gospel because I want bodies saved. Bless his holy name. That's the dimensions of it. But let me give you now, because I've held you too long. My time is just about up. Let me give you what I call the dispensational dexterity of evangelism. You say dispensation. I promise you, I'm not trying to sound deep, but dispensation simply means that things are different. It's a different era. It's a different period. And you have to be dexterous, dexterous. Another way of saying you got to be adaptive. And that is to suggest that you cannot dismiss novel tools, novel techniques, a novel technology, because this is dispensationally a time that demands dexterity. And if you don't see this as a new era, matter of fact, here's how Jesus would say in the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus would say, you've heard, but I say, I know what you've heard, but I say, you've heard, but I say, suggesting that it's transitional, hence it is dispensationally different. And because times are different, times demand dexterity. You're going to have to be adaptive. Pastor, I know you may be comfortable, but I tell you, it can't be business as usual. You have to be dexterous. Dexterity must be your standard. You cannot be apprehensive, hence timid when it comes to novel tools, techniques, and technology. Because at the end of the day, we want the gospel to be transparent. We want the gospel to be transmittable. We want the gospel to be translatable. And if we are withdrawn from novelty of tools, techniques, and technology, we're going to undermine our future. Moreover, the future of a lost world. Here it is, and, and I'm, I'm just about finished now. I'm just about finished, but I want to tell you again, pastor, members, we have to be daring because in this COVID-19 era, in this pandemic era, in this era of intense racialized disparities and realities, we must not fear being dexterous so that we can 
disseminate this glorious gospel. So he says, dispensationally, you have to be dexterous. Then here's what I say to you as I prepare to close. He says, you have to discern the demographic diversity by which you are called to do the work of evangelism. I say that again. It's in the text. He says, you got to discern the demographic diversity by which you are called to do evangelism. Let me read it. You say he's making that up. Here's what he says. Go therefore and make disciples of all, you see, all the nations demographically different, demographically diverse, divergence. He says all the nations, here it is, baptizing them in the name of the Father and, and the Son and the Holy Spirit. He says, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you. And lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. And I'm finished. But I want to say again, you demographically must discern the diversity of the audience by which you're called to witness, to evangelize. You understand? You, you're going to deal with some boomers, some busters, going to deal with some Gen Xs. You're going to deal with the millennials. You're going to deal with the Generation Z. I'm telling you, demographically, there's diversity. You got to discern it. And then you have to comport to your context. And here's what the Lord says. The Lord says, don't you forget, church, and I share this with you, Florida East Coast. He says, don't you forget that I am with you. Now, what he simply says is simply this. That I've given you a demanding, daring, disciplined, that I know without dependence, you cannot effectuate. He says, yes, I understand. You want to eventuate, but you can't because you have to totally, utterly depend on me. He says, here's my promise in presence. He says, if you will go in pedestrian, he says, here's what I can tell you, that I in perpetuity will give you the prominence of my presence. And I want to tell you this, that if we have the prominence of his presence, hence purpose in his promise, you and I can be pedestrians and prolifically proclaim that Jesus saves and we don't have to compromise our conversation. Jesus saves and he saves from the guttermost to the uttermost. Jesus saves. And it doesn't matter where you've been, what you end, perhaps what your desires are. Jesus saves and we have a dependent savior who will sojourn with us. If we would but open our mouths can share it, show it. And watch our Lord in power perfect his purpose. It's been my blessed privilege to share with you. And I pray something that I have shared, something that I've said as tenuous perhaps as my talk has been. I pray that it will have from eternity's perspective some influence, some impact. And I pray now. That you'll move indeed. Jesus says go. Of course if you go the trajectory. Your future is grand or great. Because if you go he'll go with you. I bless the Lord. Sola Deo Gloria. To God alone be the glory. Thank you. Good day, my brothers and my sisters. Thank you again for tuning in to our 118th session. And we want to most certainly appreciate and applaud uh, those persons who participated in the hour in which you have just recently been blessed. If we had been in our traditional settings, either myself or President Parrott or one of our vice moderators would be coming to you 
pleading with you to now give us a good offering. Well, guess what? We're not going to plead with you to give us a good offering. We're going to ask you to consider today becoming a covenant partner. A covenant partner is your offering. It is simply a commitment, a pledge of $240 for the entire year. And you can give, you can present that offering in increments wherever you're comfortable. $5 a session, $20 a month. Some people literally pay it all at one time. And then I want to make a special plea to all of our pastors. Brother pastors, I know that this promise, this plea of the covenant partner will not truly be blessed until you bless us. If each pastor will make a pledge and become a covenant partner during this session, I truly will be thankful of your efforts. Each and every person, our goal is 1,000 covenant partners. We want to leave this session with not less than 150. Become a covenant partner today. God bless you is our prayers. God bless you. To God be all the glory. I want to thank God for the opportunity to be here to share with you Florida East Coast Baptist Association on tonight. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much for the invitation. But I want to highlight and celebrate one of the world's greatest moderators and that is moderator Toby Philpart. Come on. Come on. Come on. Give God some encouragement. Go Go ahead and text him some encouragement as you are watching virtually. Go ahead and share with him. Oh, come on, come on. Let him know how much you appreciate his leadership, how much you appreciate him. Amen. Amen. We've been celebrating and thanking God uh, with him. We were praying when he was going through the little bout of cancer, and now he is cancer free, and we've got something to show enough, celebrate. So again, brother moderator, thank God, thank God, thank God for you. Uh, and thank you for the invitation. Now, I don't want to be before you long, and so I got just a little Easter speech. It's found over in the Gospel of John. John chapter 6 verses 1 through 14. Come, come, come with me. John chapter 6 verses 1 through 14. And tonight I'm reading from the New International Version uh, starting at verse 1 of the 6th chapter of John gospel the word of the Lord says sometime after this Jesus crossed to the far shore of the Sea of Galilee that is the Sea of Tiberias and a great crowd of people followed him because they saw the miraculous signs he had performed on the sick then Jesus went up on a mountain and sat down with his disciples now the Jewish Passover feast was near and when Jesus looked up and saw a great crowd coming toward him, he said to Philip, where shall we buy bread for these people to eat? He asked this only to test him, for he already had in mind what he was going to do. Philip answered him, eight months wages would not buy enough bread for each one of them to have a bite. And another of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, spoke up. Here's a boy with five small barley loaves and two fish. But how far will they go among so many? And Jesus said, have the people sit down. There was plenty of grass in that place, and the men sat down, about 5,000 of them. Then Jesus took the loaves, gave thanks and distributed to those who were seated as much as they wanted. He did the same with the fish. And when they had all had enough to eat, he said to his disciples, gather the pieces that are left over. Let nothing be wasted. So they gathered them and filled 12 baskets with the pieces of the five barley loaves left over by those who had eaten. After the people saw the miraculous sign that Jesus did, they began to say, Surely this is the prophet who is to come into the world. 
My brothers and sisters, tonight I want to talk to you from this thought, living life without limits, living life without limits. My brothers and sisters, there is a worldwide fascination uh, with television game shows. And out of all of the many television game shows that people love to watch, y'all, I've discovered that one game show has quickly risen to the number one rating. Catch this, not just in America, but all around the world. And if you haven't guessed it by now, the name of the game show, y'all, is Who Wants to Be a Millionaire? One of the parts, y'all, that has made this game show so popular is found in its very name. Who Wants to Be a Millionaire? It is quite safe to say that most folk would love to be millionaires. And if you think I'm doubt, if you doubt what I'm saying, all you have to do is simply look at how long the Powerball lines were the other week when it reached a billion dollars. Yeah, it lines so long I almost had to wait for an hour to get my. I'm sorry. Yeah, people were gathered in every store trying to get the lucky number. That's because most folk believe if they were millionaires, they wouldn't have to worry about a thing. That if they were millionaires, they could do anything. However, those who've been millionaires for a moment can tell you that there are plenty of things uh, that money can't do. Uh, but it's the thought, I, I admit, it's the thought of what one can do if they were a millionaire. Uh, Y'all, this is the belief uh, that you could go where you want to go, uh, have what you want to have, uh, and do what you want to do. Uh, basically, y'all, it's living life uh, with any limit. However, I've discovered that you don't have to be a millionaire nor have a lot of money in the bank to live life without limits. I argue today that this text is tailored to teach us how to live without limits. Y'all, this text that's before us this evening is one of the most popular miracle narratives of Jesus Christ. Y'all, it's so popular and important that it's the only one of Jesus' miracles that's recorded in all four of the Gospels. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Look at it. It's the largest of his miracles because in it, Jesus feeds the largest crowd, over 5,000 with one of the smallest lunches. However, I believe what makes this miracle so monumental is the way in which Jesus uses it to teach his disciples the key lessons to living life without limits. Please don't miss this. This crowd of hungry followers served as a test for the disciples. And depending on which gospel you're reading this narrative in, this seminary test that the disciples are taking is either in their first year or the last year with Jesus. Y'all, which means that this is is either this test is either their first test or their final exam and if it's the final exam which I believe that it is then there is a reason this would give pause to Jesus because after three years with him one would think that the disciples would readily know that there are no limits to what can be done 
and accomplished with God. So in order to help them move beyond living limited lives, Jesus shows them and us how to live life without limits. Uh, look at it in this text. Jesus shows that to live life without limits, you must first be able to grasp the principle of releasing. Uh, I dare you to text somebody and say you're going to have to release some stuff. Here it is in verses 5 and 6. The text says that when Jesus looked out and saw that a large crowd had arrived, he said to Philip, where can we buy bread to feed these people? people. He said this to stretch Philip's faith. He already knew what he was going to do. Uh, Y'all, this first part of the test deals with faith over finances. Uh, when we pick this miracle in John up, uh, this miracle narrative the disciples are going through, you'll discover that the disciples are already failing miserably with their final exam. Uh, Matthew, y'all, records that when asked about the hungry crowd, that the, that the disciples' response was one this is a desert place two the time is far spent and three they said send them away y'all they were failing because they didn't know the Lord's history here it is their final exam and they're failing because they didn't know their Hebrew history listen to what they told Jesus this is a desert place. Well, if they had been up on their Old Testament history, they would have learned ah, that God does his best work in desert places. Ah, they should have known ah, that he shows his might in desert places. Come on. Ah, you remember when Israel was stuck at the Red Sea, couldn't go left, couldn't go right, couldn't go back? Ah, and they complained and Moses prayed to God and God parted the waters so they walked across on dry ground. Where, where were they? Yeah, in the desert. You remember when they got to Myra and the water was too bitter to drink and they complained about dying of thirst in the desert. They were in the desert. Ah, you, you remember when they were starving like Marvin uh, wondering what they they were going to eat and Moses talked to God and God fed them with manna in the morning and quails in the evening where were they? They were in the desert by now y'all they should have known that the Lord does his best work in desert places not only were they not up on their Hebrew history ah, but then they got even worse ah, because they didn't know who Jesus was and they had the audacity to tell Jesus that the time was far spent. Please don't miss this. Y'all they told eternity that he was out of time. They told he who is from everlasting to everlasting ah, that he was out of time. They had the audacity to tell he who is out Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. That time had ran out on him. Shucks, all he had to do was just call up Martha and Mary, and Mary and Martha would have reminded them that, listen, when it comes to the Lord, he might not show up when you want him, ah, but whenever he gets there, you'll discover that he's always right to on time. 
not, not, not only are they failing because they didn't know their history, not only are they failing because uh, they didn't know their Christology, ah, but then, y'all, they had the audacity to tell Jesus uh, to send them away. Please don't miss this. Ah, uh, the church uh, facing hungry folk uh, came up with a sorry solution. Uh, no, we, we're not going to feed them. Uh, uh, Lord, just send them away. Uh, they've been with Jesus long enough now uh, to know what his motto is uh, because the Lord's motto is uh, whosoever will, uh, let them come. And while he's saying let them come, uh, the disciples got the nerve uh, to say send them away. Uh, Y'all, they are failing miserably with their final exam. Uh, so in an attempt to help them, uh, Jesus asked Philip, he says, Phil, where can we buy bread to feed these people? And Phil started counting on his fingers and in his toes and he started doing his arithmetic and he said listen, listen, listen Jesus if we had 200 pieces of silver if, if we had a year's worth of wages it wouldn't be enough to give any, all of them just one bite I feel like most preachers and church administration was looking for financial solutions Solutions to a ministry problem. You missed that. However, I like Andrew because while Phil is struggling, God allows Andrew. Yeah, he 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 he's he's, he's that helpline. There he is uh, to call for help. And Andy waves his hand and tells Jesus, I, I, "I got something. I've got a solution. I, I found a lad uh, with." a little lunch of two fish and five barley loaves and just y'all when it seemed like Andy was getting ready to rescue the disciples he kept on talking he should have hushed right there and he would have got them through this rough part of the test Ah, but he kept on talking and said but what are they among so many uh, with the finances and the food uh, they could only see the shortage uh, y'all I, I, I serve you record that they were working by sight and not by faith uh, please note preachers uh, that they failed to do the primary thing uh, please note church leaders that they failed to do the number one thing and that was they failed uh, to put it in his hands. Ah, there it is. That's the principle there. You must release what you have and put it in his hands. Ah, if my brother from another mother was here, Arthur Jackson, he would tell you, you can't save your way out of shortage. You got to sow your way out. Ah, that's it. The, the, the apostle Paul said in Galatians 6 and 7, be not deceived for God is not marked for whatsoever a man soweth that shall he also reap and then in 2 Corinthians 9 7 and 8 he said you must each decide in your heart how much to give and don't give reluctantly or in response to pressure here it is for God loves a person who gives cheerfully and God will generously provide all you need then you will always have everything you need and plenty of leftovers to share with others you missed it you, you missed it you, you, you missed it ah, the principle is put it in the Lord's hand the principle is it might not be enough ah, 
not but turn it over to the Lord. Oh, okay, come, come here, come here. A widow woman from Zarephath. Ah, yeah, if she was here, she would tell you tonight that, listen, in the midst of a famine, I, I was out collecting sticks and I ran into this strange man who was a prophet named Elijah. Now, he asked me for a drink of water. And even though it was a drought, I had some water. I said, no problem. And he said, please go fetch me uh, some water. And as I was going, he pressed his luck and said, while you're at it, uh, bring me back a whole cake also. That's when I turned around and told him, hold up, homie. You've gone too far. Uh, uh, see, I'm out here collecting wood for my final meal because all my son and I have is just a corner of meal left in the barrel and just a cap full of oil in the cruise and I'm going to fix the final and last whole cake and me and my son are going to eat it and then die. Uh, Elijah said, oh, okay, I, I hear what you're saying. Uh, I, I understand. Uh, he says, but here it is. Uh, uh, fix mine first. Uh, because the God that I serve. Uh, says that if you put him first then everything else that you need will be added to you so so here they are they at the house uh, Elijah sitting at the table uh, and here she goes after beating the barrel uh, uh, of meal to get the last corner out after taking the cap of oil and making the last whole cake and when she sat it in front of the prophet uh, the prophet told her now go and fix you and the boy uh, something to eat uh, and when she got back to the kitchen uh, she discovered that she still had uh, a corner of meal in the barrel uh, she still had uh, a cap full of cruise uh, oil in the cruise uh, and when she got up the next day uh, uh, she went in the kitchen uh, and she still had uh, a corner of meal in the barrel uh, and a cap of oil in the cruise why because she took what she had and put it in the Lord's hands and little becomes much if you put it in his hands uh, uh, the need uh, they had y'all could only be met by the seed they would sow uh, tell your neighbor your need is going to be met by your seed uh, no no baby don't eat your seed I know we're in a recession and I know things are tight but don't, no, no, don't eat your seed don't, don't eat your seed because your need will be met by your seed when you put it mm, in his hands uh, uh, yeah there are some folk uh, who are here tonight uh, who, who can testify little does uh, become much uh, when you put it in the master's hand I, I've got some folk uh, who can testify watch this in 2020 lost my job still ain't got another one ah, but I ain't missed a meal uh, not one bill uh, has gone unpaid not one time uh, have the lights flickered off not one time have the car been repossessed. Why? Because I took what I had and I put it in his hand and the Lord has showed me ah, that little can become much. <laughs> let, let me push. Now, in, in order to live life without limits, not only must you be able to grasp the principle of releasing, but secondly, y'all, you must be able to get in a posture of readiness. Here it is. In verse 10, Jesus tells the disciples to have them sit down, have the people sit down. Uh, uh, here it is. They, they put them in a position to receive. Uh, uh, they're hungry. And they started sitting the groups down. Uh, uh, depending on which uh, gospel you're reading, they sat them in 50s and uh, groups of hundreds. They, they sat them down. And, and, and simply from putting them uh, in, in a position to receive, uh, that, that put them in a posture of readiness. Uh, that, listen, he wouldn't be sitting us down if he wasn't getting ready to do something. He, 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 he wouldn't uh, be putting us in groups if food 
food wasn't getting ready to be passed out. Uh, uh, they're in a, a posture of readiness uh, because of their position and their posture. Here it is. They are now ready to receive. Uh, but let me come and get you uh, because I discovered uh, that, that when, uh, there it is, uh, you, 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 you get in the posture uh, of readiness, uh, then you've got to be ready uh, to receive. Well, here it is. A, 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 a couple of years ago, um, there was this great battle that happened mostly on social media between uh, uh, Popeye's fried chicken and the reigning champion of chicken sandwiches, Chick-fil-A. Now, now, please, please don't get me wrong. If you're looking at the numbers of uh, people served, they, they, they got McDonald's beat. They, uh, Chick-fil-A got something going on, child. Lord, have mercy. Uh, they've got double lines, people outside. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Chick-fil-A with that chicken sandwich, Lord, have mercy, has been winning uh, in serving folk. If you're just counting the sheer numbers, uh, uh, so good are their numbers uh, that the executives at Popeye sat back in the boardroom and they said listen here um, uh, we do chicken too we, we chicken people like they chicken people uh, uh, and, and we can make pretty good chicken ourselves uh, and, and there is no reason uh, why we can't beat them in the chicken game uh, with making a chicken sandwich of our own uh, you, you remember uh, Popeye's came up with a recipe uh, for a chicken sandwich uh, they rolled Hold it out. My son called me and said, Dad, whatever you do, if you get a chance, you got to get over to Popeye's and get you one of those chicken sandwiches. I got the Popeye's lying down the street. I finally got up to the building and got that sandwich. I said, can't be this good. It can't be this good. And I pulled over because I didn't want to drive while I was trying it. I pulled it out and the doggone thing was that big. I said, well, it's bigger than a Chick-fil-A sandwich. I, I took the first bite and juice ran all down my mouth. I said, Whoo! oh God, they own us something here. I, I, I trying to decipher, was it white meat or dark meat? I don't know. Whatever it was, that chicken sandwich was good. Our Popeyes came out swinging on Chick-fil-A. Our Popeyes, y'all, uh, discovered soon after they came out with the sandwich um, that they weren't ready to receive all the business that was coming. Uh, I submitted unto them that you all should have took some lessons from Chick-fil-A. Chick-fil-A would have told you if you got a good chicken sandwich, you're going to need two drive through lines. Chick-fil-A would have told them if you got a good chicken sandwich, you're going to have to put your drive through attendance not on the inside but on the outside to take orders. And Chick-fil-A could have really helped them and told them, listen, not only do you need to put your attendance on the outside, but you got to get a better attitude than what y'all got over here at Popeye's. You got to act like you're glad to take somebody's order and not mad that you had work today. Ah, but then they could have told them the final and best thing that they had to do. Here it is, Popeye's. Once you've done all of that, then you got to make sure that you have enough chicken sandwiches not to run out. Ah, uh, Popeye's problem. Ah, uh, they, 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 they got in a posture of readiness. Ah, uh, but they failed uh, to get in a position to receive all of that that was coming. Uh, I want to tell you uh, that make sure that when you sow your seed, uh, that you are expecting and ready for the overflow. When you sow your seed and make sure that you are ready for all that the Lord has for you ah because when you put it in his hand you ought to get ready for overflow 
let, let me push in, in order to live life without limits not only must you be able to grasp the principle of releasing and able to get in the posture of readiness but then you must also be able to give God the proper response somebody shout give him the right response in, in verse 11a and 11b the text says that Jesus took the loaves gave thanks and took the fish and gave thanks uh, here it is y'all he gave thanks in spite of the quantity uh, please don't miss this with only two small fish Jesus still thank God you, you, you missed it he, he's only got two small fish but with two small fish he still told God thank you uh, why give God thanks over two small fish with a crowd like this I, I submit unto you that even though two is a long way from 5,000 it's still greater than zero you miss your shout ah he had something to work with ah, it might be small but that's all right with God the Bible says despise not small beginnings ah you got to be faithful over the little ah so God can make you ruler over much not only did he thank God in spite of the quantity but then he thanked God in spite of the quality with just five barley loaves Jesus gave God thanks the text says y'all that the bread was made from barley please don't miss this uh, barley bread is barely bread uh, barley y'all is the cheapest uh, type of grain that you could find from farmers uh, barley was the wheat uh, or the grain uh, that the farmers used for their livestock uh, it, it had some rough stuff in it uh, it was it, when you chew it it had some parts uh, that were hard to chew uh, barley y'all was known as poor man's bread ah uh, but Jesus still gave th you miss your shout uh, that no matter how barely bread barley bread was uh, Jesus still told God thank you ah uh, let me come and get you ah, sometimes you can't get hung up on what the quality is uh, and you got to just thank God because you got something I remember when my brother and I were young my father came home with an old beat up brown Buick uh, he drove up into the driveway and we were scratching our heads wonder where dad got that from he came in the house he called my brother and me uh, to him he took the keys and put it in my brother's hand he said I went and got y'all a car you can go to school and go where you want to go in the car it, it, did I tell you it was brown uh, it, yeah it was brown mostly because it was rusty I had windows that didn't go up anymore and once we got them up we had to tape them in place ah but when we got out there my brother and I was so happy to have a car we didn't care how beat up and how ugly it was uh, it was better than what we had before. I hear you asking well what did you have before? Uh, we had Chevrolet uh, where we shoveled our right foot and then laid the left one down next to it uh, because we were walking. Uh, we had the bus uh, where we stood in the rain and waited uh, on the school bus to come and pick us up. Uh, but now my father had given us uh, an old beat up Buick uh, that got us from point A to point B uh, and we came back in the house and told my father and my mother thank you for the car we got all of our friends we drove around the city and we enjoyed the vehicle why because it might not have looked like much but it was more than we had is there anybody here that can testify that what I used to have I learned how to give God thanks for it ah because it was better when I didn't have a thing. Uh, there's a story told uh, about a rich man that drives up uh, to the grocery store uh, and all the folk are sitting there looking at him pull up in his Rolls Royce uh, and everybody's wondering I wonder how did he get that Rolls Royce uh, but when the man got out nobody would ask. Uh, finally a young boy who was standing there asked uh, 
what the rest was scared to ask. And he said, sir, I, I want to know how did you get the Rolls Royce? And the man looked back at him and he said, I got the Rolls Royce because I knew how to tell God thank you for the Pinto. And if you can't thank him for the little stuff, he'll never elevate you to the next that's it I'm out of my time I got to get out of here in order to live life without limits not only must you be able to grasp the principle of releasing get in a posture of readiness give God the proper response but finally to live a life without limits you must be able to gather up the proof of his reliability uh, somebody shout I've got proof that he's reliable in verses 12 and 13 the text says when they had all had enough to eat he said to his disciples gather the pieces that are left over let nothing be wasted and so they gathered them and filled 12 baskets with the pieces of the five barley loaves left over by those who had eaten please don't miss this the first thing I see on my way out of here is that he had they had failure and favor Ah, y'all here it is I, the disciples had failed the test miserably ah but all failure ain't bad failure because sometimes failure is the fuel you need to get you to your success uh, let me come and get you I remember when I turned 16 and I went down to get my driver's license you, you know my permanent ones and I got in there and I, I took the written test yes I can parallel park with the best of them. Then I got inside and I had to take the written test. I had been studying the book for over a year. I'm clicking through the test and I'm getting everything right. And then finally I get to road signs and boom! I see a sign that I'm not sure about. Uh, well, let me come and get you. It was a yellow sign and on this yellow sign there were uh, two squiggly lines. Uh, and the choices were uh, uh, two that I knew weren't, but, but here's where I struggled because one choice uh, was winding road and the other choice was slippery when wet. And so I looked at it and it looked like tire prints. So I said, surely it's winding road. And I clicked winding road. A few signs later, I come to a solid arrow that snake going up choices once again two were winding road or slippery when wet I thought to myself well if the other one was winding road then surely this must be slippery when wet I, I got those two answers wrong and, and, and watch this they were the only two I got wrong and that was when I was 16 I'm 52 now uh, but let me help you I've never missed them again because I missed and failed on those two on the test I since have learned that the solid line is winding road and the double line is slippery when wet why because I learned from my failure and I believe I got some folk here who can testify that you've got some failures in your past ah, that have helped to propel you to your success uh, but not only that but I saw favor after failure uh, please don't miss this the doubting disciples uh, y'all who put nothing in are blessed by Jesus to take 12 baskets out uh, please, please don't miss this when Jesus asked them how shall we feed them uh, Judas grabbed the money bag tighter they said mm, we ain't got no money we ain't got no money we ain't got no money and as a result they didn't put anything of theirs in the kitty uh, and so if you didn't put in the miracle is that even though they didn't put in they got out let me help you I was in college and when you're in college ah uh, yeah we get together on the weekend and, and we'd all put our money in so we could have some drinks for the party ah uh, but we took note of those who didn't put anything in and we told them now, now listen because you didn't put anything in 
uh, don't let me catch you with anything other than chasing. I, I better not see uh, you with one bottle of something uh, because you didn't put in anything. Uh, you, you are on soda and water for the rest of the night uh, because the rule is uh, in order to take out, you got to kick in. Uh, ah, but what I like about Jesus uh, is they failed to put anything in. Uh, but even after failure, he gave them favor uh, and allowed each one of them uh, to get a basket full on the back end. Uh, well, here's where I really shout uh, because out of that 12 uh, is Judas uh, who Jesus already knew uh, was going to betray him. Uh, and even knowing the low down dirty rascal he was, uh, he still blessed him with favor to have a basket of his own. Ah, and for no other reason you ought to shout because God gives us favor after failure well that's all I got y'all Jesus is leaving his disciples uh, not long after the test that's why I believe this was the final exam and he's getting ready to leave them and go back to the father but before he leaves he wants them to catch some stuff and the reason he tells them to get 12 baskets full is because the baskets are the proof of his reliability ah he left them with proof that with God they can live life without limits he left them with proof that they there is nothing too hard for our God. He left them with proof that there is never a time that our God won't come through. He left them with proof that after you've done all that you can do, put it in his hands and watch him do what you couldn't do. That's all I got. Good evening Florida East Coast and thank you real kind but before I go I'm reminded of the hymn writer who summed it up perfectly when he asked the question have you any rivers that seem uncrossable and have you any mountains that you cannot tunnel through well God specializes in things that were thought impossible and he can do with no other power no other Holy Ghost power can do that's all I got but if I could get you to encounter somebody in the midst of the pandemic I dare you to find somebody and say to them I don't know what you're going through I don't know how rough life has been in the pandemic but here's what I got be not dismayed whatever be tied God will take care, take care of you beneath his wing where love abides. God will take care of you. That's all I got, but I'm living life without limits. I'm living life without limits because I know that the Lord can do everything but fail. Is there anybody here that can testify? Won't he make a way out of no way? Won't he put food on your table? I know he's able and 
and he will do what other folk thought couldn't be done. I believe I got some walking testimonies who can testify that look at me, you're looking at a miracle. And the God I serve will never let me down. He always, he's always right on time. Even in a pandemic, you can live life without limits if you only trust him with what you have. Watch God do what no other power can do. God bless you. God keep you. Love you. And thank you again. God bless. God bless you, my brothers and sisters. We are trusting and hoping again at this time of invitation that you certainly uh, have been encouraged by our God. Listen, brothers and sisters, I'm, we are a part of what we believe one of the greatest associations this side. Evident of that is by, the, by way of the message that you just heard. We are, we are excited about how God has blessed us with all of the talent that he's get, get blessed us with. And here we are extending to you the invitation. Why? Because we believe that you need a covering in your life. We are trusting and hoping that this message has touched you in such a manner that God will lead you to become a part of some Bible-believing, Bible-teaching church. How do we do that? Well, if you notice on your side of your screen, there is a chat box in that chat box, you can simply type in your information. Type in that information in that chat box. Our, one of our uh, locators will, uh, will notice this information, certainly uh, adhere to this information and respond to this information. We're encouraging you to do that because we not on a crusade for Christ, but our job, one of the missions of this, our church, is evangelism. We, 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 we deal with mission. We deal with education. But I think one of the best part is evangelism. And evangelism is a part of uh, what we're doing right now. So if you encourage to be connected with one of our churches, we encourage you to connect today. As far south as uh, Florida City, far north as Coco, full of churches ready to receive you. Will you come? God bless you. <laughs>